welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. In 1136, the Emperor Ioannis Komnenos unveiled the massive new monastic foundation of his dynasty in Constantinople. This is the Pandokrator Monastery, which he had built together with his wife, uh, the Hungarian um, bride Piroska, named Irini in Greek, uh, who had died a few years earlier. So the monastery's charter was issued in his name. Uh, this, these charters in Byzantine Greek are called Tipika. And what's extraordinary about this Tipikon of the Pandokrator Monastery is that it contains very detailed provisions for the operation of a hospital on the grounds of the monastery with regulations about uh, hospital staff, doctors, orderlies, and so forth, uh, very specialized equipment and procedures, uh, separate wings for different kinds of patients, and so forth. It's a fascinating document. Um, and if you want to study this side of things, um, I refer you to Tim Miller's excellent book, uh, The Invention of the Hospital, no, The Birth of the Hospital um, in the Byzantine Empire, um, which is an incredible study. Okay, so what interests us here is that one of the wings was for female patients, and the regulations stipulate uh, that there are going to be two doctors assigned to this wing. Um, they were supposed to do the rounds and so forth. And so listen to this. There will be two doctors for the women's ward, and they will be accompanied by one female doctor, four certified female assistants, two auxiliary female assistants, and two female orderlies. I read here from the excellent Dumbarton Oaks uh, translation of all the Byzantine typica. Now, it is fascinating to consider that there were, in 12th century Constantinople, trained professional female doctors, and not just doctors, but a whole gradation of occupations relating to the medical field, um, such as are listed here, assistants, auxiliary assistants, orderlies, and so on. And the charter actually lists the salaries of the employees, and wouldn't you know it, the female doctors receive two-thirds of the salary of the male doctors. But even that is extraordinary, uh, if you think about the period. And I just wonder, who are these women, and where did they come from, and how did they, what kind of upbringing, educational trajectory, career aspirations did they have that they reach that point, like where there was a pool of them, where you know, pr presumably the Pantocrator Monastery could draw um, on on local talent. Who are these people? One of the reasons this fascinates me is because it cuts against the gender norms of this society as we have reconstructed them. In fact, as numerous texts from this society, you know, when they tell us what the gender norms are or what they expect them to be. There doesn't seem to be any room for women actually doing this. And insofar as we write women's history based on the gender norms, we would entirely miss all of that. We would not be able to predict it, uh, and we would not be able to explain it. This has interested me for some time, in part because of some personal experiences I had a long time ago. I dated a dentist. I was an American, blonde from Michigan, and there was <laughs> we had trouble convincing colleagues at the university that she was actually a dentist. No, okay, so she looked younger than she was, though we were like in our late twenties, I you know, mid late twenties, something like that. And when I would introduce her, she would introduce herself and say she's a dentist. Professors like academic colleagues theoretically invested in feminism and so forth would do a double take and they would look at her hard and say, oh, you mean a hygienist? And she was, no, no, a dentist. And they'd look at her like skeptical. You know how a hygienist, right? Okay, so there are numerous studies which purport to find that the kind of mental image that you know, we have of a doctor is of an older man. Right now, all of these studies have their problems, but uh, 
I think that's fairly safe to say. Um, if they ask children to draw a doctor, it's usually an older man. And there's a lot of concern about this, obviously, you know, how you know, social perceptions can affect people's you know, aspirations and career paths and so forth. And yet, enrollments in medical school right now and for some time have been at parity. I mean, between the sexes. And, and, and in fact, it seems that women are now pulling ahead. So there might be more women enrolling in medical school. And at, at the very least, what that means is that the sort of gender norms and expectations that we might all share don't actually do very much to shape uh, people's careers. <laughs> like what the actual outcomes of, you know, who goes to medical school, who becomes a doctor. Or at least they don't do so in an obvious way. And this, of course, presupposes that you've removed any kind of overt obstacles uh, to women doing that. And this brings me back to Byzantium as well, where, again, we would never have been able to predict that there were female professional doctors paid at at least two-thirds or three-fourths, I can't remember now, of the salary of the, their male counterparts. So this is why I was thrilled to find um, the paper by my guest today, Anna Kelly, at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, uh, which is about a similar question, actually kind of about the same question, but situated in a different period and setting. So this is the Roman Empire and later Roman Empire, and it's specifically textile production and industry and the marketing of clothes and textiles, where based on gender norms, whether the ones that we infer or the ones that we see in texts, historians, modern historians, have kind of written women out of um, the uh, certain important aspects of that industry and can confine them to the spinning of wool part of the process. And this is where the study of women's history requires not only an engagement with the study of gender, and kind of social norms and expectations and such, but also the very hard work of, you know, digging through all of the data and compiling actual information about what happened. So all of these different data points and bringing them into a co coherent picture where Anna manages to show that, no, in fact, women were involved in all phases of the process and ran businesses and were involved in the marketing and selling, you know, bulk uh, marketing of, of textile products. And that history written on the basis of gender norms misses a lot of this. And she presents some very interesting um, data about women running businesses and you know, not, not certainly owning property and disposing of property, which we always knew they did. But it seems that they were doing so on a scale that has hitherto remained largely invisible um, until someone actually does the hard work of finding it um, and correlating it to you know, gender norms. This, this is a dialectical process of working between the two. But OK, I'll stop there. Uh, so without any further delay, here's my conversation with uh, Anna Kelly. And thanks also to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Hello, Anna. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invitation. So I'm so glad that, you know, some people, you in particular, are working on labor issues because it's a very difficult area to penetrate and access what exactly is going on on the ground, right? Obviously, you know, most of our literary sources, they don't talk about these things because labor is not something that our authors sort of engaged in very much or cared about. They had a pretty low opinion of people who, you know, worked for a living. Um, so it's, it's important to try to synthesize all the material that we have. And let's talk about, so specifically, we're talking about uh, women's labor today. Um, and so why don't we start off, um, tell us, so what is the sort of idealized picture of women's labor that we find in text? Like, what are, you know, proper, you know, Roman women supposed to be doing at home? So the ideal Roman woman, you know, um, is supposed to be weaving and producing textiles, um, specifically wool working is the term that we find in texts. And it's very much associated with this idea of moral and, and virtuous uh, projections of womanhood, regardless of class or age. 
Um, and so in Rome, the act of woolworking becomes an important part of the imperial propaganda around the image of the ideal mother in particular, and it represents her dedication to her family. Um, and it's later adopted in Christian rhetoric as well. And we, we see these images of women and textile production in both text and uh, visual representations um, as a metaphor for the model of the, the good woman. So as an example, in um, Homer's epic, The Odyssey, we have the hero Odysseus. He's traveling for 10 years, trying to get back home to Ithaca. Um, following the Trojan War, and his wife Penelope is at home waiting for him mm. during this entire time, despite you know all this pressure to remarry, and she has suitors who are coming up to her, and and uh, she is trying to hold them at bay. And one of the ways she does this is she says, "Well, I need to weave a funeral shroud for my father-in-law," and so she spends three years weaving this shroud by day, and then every night goes through and she's unpicking it. Mm. and undoing all of her work to kind of draw out this process. So here we see that her textile work uh, is, is a metaphor for her faithfulness to her husband. And this idea of women in textile work, it carries on right through into the Christian period. You know, we see images of the Virgin with her, her spinning tools, and sometimes she's even spinning threads. Um so it, it becomes this ideal construction that serves both rhetorical and, and moral purposes. But of, of course, this doesn't mean it's an actual reflection of reality. Sure. I find it interesting that for even for women of uh, the upper class, that there was an image of idealized labor because it's difficult to find like the equivalent for men unless it, it was soldiering. Right. Like things you do with your hands being, you know, socially prized. Um, and because labor in general is kind of devalued. And I, I just find it interesting that even for upper class women, that it was, you know, part of the package of their virtues. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get to, back to that in a moment. But at any rate, this kind of weaving is for domestic consumption, right? It's for the benefit of the family. Like our ancient, ancient sources don't talk about women as engaged in like, quote, industrial or work workshop production of textiles for the market, right? And modern historians have followed those sources in that regard. So can you talk a little about the difference between, quote, sort of unskilled or what, amateur domestic labor that a woman does for her family and then textile production for the market. So how has that distinction been construed? So the idea of, of differentiating between domestic and com uh, commercial labor stems from the notion that you can divide the ancient world into two spheres. This is very popular concept uh, when talking about the Roman world. So one is domestic and private, and the other is basically everything else outside of the home and it's public. And there's an understanding of space that is very much rooted in this highly moralized world of actually the 18th and 19th century Britain and Europe, when we start to mm -hmm. see a lot of histories of Rome begin to um, beginning to be written. And it's here that we have domestic spaces being seen as the purview of women and everything else is, is the concern of men. So when you couple this with the idea that professional tasks and training are supposed to take place outside of the home, uh, we get a construction in which anything women are doing inside the home is considered not professional and therefore unskilled because they're not being trained outside of the home either. And so therefore it's not for the commercial market. And then when you add the moral rhetoric of the Roman period to it, um, it just seems to kind of confirm this construction. Uh, and, and as a side note, it's kind of interesting to think about in terms of where we are now with the pandemic, where, you know, we had huge parts of the workforce working from home for a really mm. long time. And now there's a lot of debates going on about, you know, going back to work, meaning to work outside of the home and, right. you know, employers want people to come back into the offices and, and things like that. So we still have these constructions uh, of where we think work is supposed to take place. And it's just had a really long lasting impact on how we 
conceptualize labor in the ancient world as well. Yes, it's interesting that you should say that because the debate is framed currently as between employers and employees, the former who want their workforce to come into the professional workplace so that presumably so they can control them better. I, I, I don't see any other advantage unless there's a practical one. And employees who, you know, have learned, oh, wait, I can do this without the commute, right? And less so as a kind of gender dynamic where, you know, men have kind of internalized this idea that, you know, having a job or going to work literally means going to work, not from your bedroom to, you know, the couch. Um, but in the ancient world, there definitely is this kind of gender dynamic that we apply. Uh, so how do our economic historians think about um, where, like, large-scale production of textiles took place? Like, how do they how do they imagine that, but in both gender and spatial terms? Where did it happen? Who did it? I think um, it's very much centered on the idea of the Roman Forum as this splay, this space of, of um, commercial enterprise, and that because this is a public space, this is this is an area where you find men and men working and things like that. Um, but added to this is the fact that we actually the archaeology of labor and of space and production is actually still kind of in its infancy. Mm. So one of the things that we find in Egypt, where a lot of my research uh, is centered, is that workshops, for example, are in houses. Um, people either are, they have their own workshops within their own houses, or they're actually renting rooms in other people's houses to, to function as their workshops. So even though a lot of times we're thinking about, uh, you know, the, the commercial markets and things as being separate to a domestic residence, the reality is that actually there is not this kind of really strict delineation that we would uh, we would recognize, I think. Yes, I'm not so, sure if that was the most successful explanation. No, no, these are difficult concepts to parse because our categories of private and public don't map on to those of the ancient world, um, and are in fact inherently kind of contradictory in, in, in many regards, um, and so you know we think of. Uh, in sort of production for the market as being something public and domestic production as being, you know, uh, sort of domestic and private. But if you have workshops within homes, um, it, then it, it all kind of becomes very blurred. Um, so why don't you tell us in this connection, what is a taberna? Because uh, you talk about those in your article as well. Yeah, so the taberna is kind of, um, it's like a studio. It's a, a studio, but also can be a retail space. So it's kind of just a, a generalized commercial um, space that can be used for lots of different things. So we find evidence that they're being used as workshops as well. Um, you know, they can be kind of shop fronts. So um, they they add to what ends up being a very complex picture of where production is taking place within you know, all different, different parts of the empire. Okay. So tell us also one more distinction, but before we get to the evidence that you have found, and that is a distinction between spinning and weaving, because apparently this has been kind of fundamental to how the a labor process has been broken down and discussed in modern economic history and sort of assigning, you know, gender roles to these different processes. So I imagine that most of our audience has neither spun nor woven anything, myself included. Uh, so maybe just walk us a little bit through that process, uh, which was kind of important for the production of ancient textiles and clothes, which, you know, everybody remember. So everybody in the empire was clothed. There may be about like 50 or 60 million people at any time, right? So you just imagine the bulk of production that needed to be going on all the time. Uh, so tell us about these two different processes. Yeah, so just to to add on to what you said, you're right. It's important to remember that the textile industry is huge in this time period. Um, it's employing a lot of people, and it's incredibly time consuming as well. 
And spinning is actually one of the more time consuming processes in, in the entire manufacturing um, process. And it, that's simply just turning the raw fiber into a thread. Um, and it's traditionally seen as a woman's task. And like I said, there's all of these um, metaphors about women spinning and, and uh, it comes up again and again in the imagery. But we also have monastic texts that talk about men spinning. So there does seem to be some context in which men are also performing this production step. Um, and it's, it's probably something that does take place largely in the home because you don't, you don't really need much equipment to perform mm -hmm. it. You need, um, something called a spindle whorl, which is weighting the fibers down and a distaff, which you're, you're turning to actually spin the fibers into the thread. And it's a very similar process for wool, flax, cotton, um, you know, in Egypt, you even find textiles made out of camel hair. Um, so they're doing this with a lot of different types of materials. Weaving, on the other hand, you do need more equipment. Um, there's several different types of looms that are being used in the Roman world kind of concurrently. Um, but probably the one of the more prevalent one is, is the warp weighted loom, which would be a wooden, a wooden loom that you can just kind of prop up. The warp threads are weighted down so that they just kind of fall. And then you're weaving the weft in between the warp mm -hmm. threads. Um, and this is something you're doing with a loom that would be highly mobile. Uh, it's not something that's necessarily fixed to the ground or to a wall or anything like that. Um, but the act of weaving, and particularly if you're kind of, if you're weaving patterns uh, or figures or anything like that, does take more skill and training. And so this is the reason that weaving has been constructed as a male task and spinning, which is something that you don't really need much equipment for, you don't really need much training for, has been constructed as a female task. And it, it goes back to this division between domestic and um, and public spheres and the idea of unskilled labor versus skilled labor. Right. So the idea is that women do the spinning, uh, which is low skill, and men do the weaving, which is more sort of technically demanding. Right. And it, But of course, there's this inherent contradiction here because if women are expected to be proficient weavers for their households, uh, and weaving is part of their domestic education, then of, of course, they're able to be weavers. Um, and for a long time, this was something that was just kind of glossed over, or it was reasoned that women's weaving wasn't as refined, and they didn't have the skill to weave certain patterns or, or things like that. So that's kind of how this division was being maintained, despite the fact that women were so closely associated with textile production and with weaving and producing in all, all sorts of different ways. Right. So tell us a little bit about the evidence that you have found about women engaged in, you know, the full sort of manufacturing process and even running commercial businesses for textile production. Yeah. So a lot of my evidence comes from Egypt where we have really vast collections of papyri and the reason these are important is because they're detailing everyday interaction. So it's not like the literary text where we have, you know, issues of representation and bias and, mm. you know, who the author is and these things. These are letters, they're contracts, um, petitions, uh, tax receipts, all, you know, business accounts, all of just the very mundane recordings of everyday life. And in these papyri, we see references to women weaving in workshops. They're being hired to, to weave in workshops. Um, some of them are paying the weaver's tax. We have uh, an apprentice contract where there's a girl who's being apprenticed to a master weaver who is a woman. And there's you know references to women managing weaving workshops as well, um, probably as part of a family unit. Um, 
but they are the ones who are making decisions about hiring and they're the ones who are acquiring raw materials and they are, you know, purchasing different products from each other, dyes, threads, things like that. Uh, and they're also taking orders from people to produce textiles. So we're seeing that they're involved in many, many different steps. Um, and it's also illustrating that there are many ways of producing and consuming textiles in this period. It's a very diverse industry. Yeah, I love the fact also that you picked up on the uh, this 11th century text by Psalos about the uh, uh, sort of festival, sort of, uh, you know, uh, what else? It was a procession and a display of their work by the women of Constantinople. I had translated that text at one point. Um, and so this is 11th century is a festival of Agathe or Agatha, or, but it's not clear what it means. But it seems that they, you know, displayed the, their handiworks, you know, to the city with you know, apparent pride. Um, and in, in preparing for our conversation, I actually was looking over some of the poems from that period because I remembered there was one and I found it. Um, and this is a poet called Christophorus Mytilineos, mm -hmm. 11th century. And he wrote this poem about, uh, I think, okay, I'm, I might get some of the details wrong here. A cake that one of his sort of kinswomen had did a cousin or something had written had had baked sorry in the shape of a astronomical like zodiac chart where putting the egg strategically to symbolize of you know whatever she had the constellations and he was looking at this thing and he's writing this poetic exorcis of it and he has this line that is something like the skill of women is amazing <laughs> <laughs> which you know What's a guy to do after that is just write a poem about it, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> um, so what other professions have you found evidence that free women worked in? Um, so actually, it's it's really diverse. Um, they could run businesses, especially if they inherited them from their husband or from their father. And in particular, money lending um, is a mm. place where we see women conducting a lot of business and in their own name, which is really interesting. And this isn't something I've, I haven't fully worked through what this means, um, but it's something I've started to think about because a lot of times you also see them being named as tax contributors. Um, so clearly these are, are women who are able to attain a pretty high place in society. Um, so this is something I'm still looking into, um, but they're also, they're depicted as being active in a lot of different manufacturing, uh, industries that I should say, when I say they're depicted, that there might be a few references, or maybe there's an inscription, um, the evidence for these under industries at the moment is not as comprehensive as for textile manufacture, but, um, there are references to women working as calligraphers and scribes, glass blowers, um, cobblers, gem setters, perfumers, um, and they probably they would have also been involved in the retail of these goods. And then in the service sector, you know, women were obviously acting as midwives and other kind of medical practitioners, nurses. Um, there's even a few references of where they're they're called doctor. Um, and then, you know, innkeepers, cooks, the things that we would kind of maybe more traditionally associate with women's activities, um, as well as the, you know, quote unquote, objectionable industries, mm. prostitution and, and various forms of entertainment. Um, but possibly they're even involved in manual labor. And there's a case where um, there's a guild of builders in in Italy where the list of the guild members includes several women. So, so potentially they're involved in, in some sort of manual labor, um, also brick making. Oh. So these are these are just a few of the examples that I've come across. I feel like, you know, as we start to transcribe more and more of the Egyptian papyri, there's just so many opportunities to find more examples. Actually, one that I was just thinking of, I was just reading the other day about a basket maker. So it's, I think, uh, something that's going to increasingly 
become apparent that women were actually involved in a lot of different industries, maybe not in a very high proportion, but it's not necessarily this um, very strict distinction between women in the domestic sphere and they have to be kept you know, sequestered away and they're not involved in any kind of commercial industry. Uh, clearly there are circumstances where they are involved in, in the economy and in the commercial economy. Um, and it's just, it's figuring out what the context of that is, that uh, is the challenge at the moment. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the methodological issues that this poses as well, because it, it sounds like your work involves a lot of um, sort of mole work, like digging, digging, digging through the sort, finding little bits, finding little bits, right, and and accumulating um, a, a kind of aggregate picture, uh, which is a very different kind of work, uh, no pun intended, um, than the kind of rhetorical analysis of social norms that was, you know, much more prevalent maybe 20, 30 years ago, right, where you're looking at literary representations of women in texts that are designed to do that and finding that these are, you know, highly constructed rhetorical narratives that we can't rely on to do social history. And I remember that Elizabeth Clark wrote this famous article called The Lady Vanishes, where, like, no, this is not an actual person in that you find in Gregory of Nyssa's work. It's a very rhetorical construction that he, a representation of his uh, sister, I believe. And it's just his ideas, uh, his ideals. Like this isn't, we don't get to real women, right? And the kind of work that you're doing is sort of circumventing this a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about the, methodo the, the methodological implications of all of this? Like, are we headed into a new kind of phase or? Yeah, I, I think um, with what Elizabeth Clark was writing about this idea of, you know, representation and not hearing the real voices of women, um, we see the place where the Egyptian papyri and their value really comes out um, because these they're not literary texts. Uh, like I said, they're letters, contracts, business ledgers. Um, they're, they're just recording everyday life. That is their purpose. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they're not even really meant to be preserved in any way. Their preserve, preservation is completely accidental. Mm. And these are texts where we do get real women's voices uh, because some of them are, they're even being written by women. Um, and we get documents that are written to them. Uh, we're getting things that are recording their everyday actual reality. So this is why when I started approaching this, this topic, I actually started with the papyri before looking at other kinds of texts. And it kind of gave me a control group with which to analyze other documents. Um, so I do, you know, I I looked a little bit at um, John Chrysostom and what he's saying about women and women's labor. And, um, you oh, know, boy. they're not good things, but yes. he, he is at the same time confirming that they're present. Um, so maybe he's not giving us an idea of what their actual reality is, but they're there. So, okay, we have that confirmation and we can look at the papyri then to get an idea of what the reality actually is. Um, yes. And it, this idea of kind of combing through the documents, you know, maybe I started out as an archeologist, so, so that's uh, maybe where I get this from. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, just trying to put together these kind of smaller samples into, well, what is this saying about the larger social picture? Um, and I think specifically the use of the Egyptian papyri is is now starting to become more popular mm. as these kinds of studies can demonstrate their value and their applicability to regions outside of Egypt. Um, for a long time, they were kind of disregarded because Egypt was seen as being so unusual within the Roman Empire, within the, um, you know, the early Byzantine Empire. But as we start to get papyri from other places as well, so the Palmyra papyri, the Nisana papyri, uh, actually they're showing that very similar concerns are being recorded. So maybe Egypt isn't as unusual as, as we really have thought of it as. Yeah. The, uh, so how do you write social history from John Chrysostom is basically 
take all of the things that he doesn't like and he's complaining about, yeah, those things are what's happening. Not the idealized picture that he would like to present uh, or that, that he wants to push, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. sort of reading him against the grain, I think, is so necessary. Yeah. So but he sometimes... talks about how it's it's so shameful to see women in the marketplace. Yes. Okay, well, well, they're there. They're not ashamed. They're there. So. Yes, absolutely. Um, and there wasn't much that he could do about it. Uh, that's another thing that I like about this society. You know, you, you have all of these people writing the sources, um, you know, the, the sort of bearded class who don't like seeing women in the streets. And yet in the end, they stayed in the streets and it was these bearded types who had to go off and wall themselves off behind, you know, in the desert or wherever, so as not to be disturbed by whatever. Um, it's, it's quite the opposite choice um, of what, you know, they could have done as a society. I, um, but so I was thinking, this is a while ago, I had sort of struggled with this question because I work primarily with literary sources. And I, I understand that sometimes they're very, um, you know, rhetorically constructed, you can't trust them. And in fact, some of these, like even ancient classical Greek stereotypes persist in the rhetoric for like centuries and millennia after they have any relation to social life, right? Like the whole idea of the women's chambers in the house. Mm -hmm. Like we know that Byzantines didn't live that way, that couples, you know, had the same, you know, bedroom or whatever. But this idea from classical text just kind of survived as a trope, you know, and you, you start getting the houses and it's like, no, these things don't exist. Um, but that even literary text, you know, you might be able to get around this problem. I, so I remember a case this is from a collection of uh, miracle um, miracles of St. Artemius, 7th century, Constantinople. And it, it just starts off saying, well, there's this woman and she's running this business in a bath. She's running a bathhouse and she, she has to run it and she has to be there all the time. And her child has some illness and she wants to go to the saint to seek help, but she can't because her husband's like, I don't know, a deadbeat or lazy or whatever and doesn't show up. And so she doesn't have time off. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's so, I mean, that's not something that the text has made up. But if the text is pushing an agenda, it's that the saint later healed a child. Mm -hmm. It's not that the woman is running a bathhouse. Anyway, I thought that was uh, that was good. Um, I like that. Um, the The issue of deadbeat husbands, that comes up a lot in the papyri as well. I was reading one recently where there was um, a woman and she's making a a petition to some officials in, in her village. And she's talking about how her husband left her and he took all their money and she doesn't know where he is, but she's been left with this child. She has a toddler and she's going blind and she can't work and she doesn't know what to do and she needs help. Um, so yeah, this this issue of the husband just disappearing and not doing anything. This, this is reflective of reality, perhaps <laughs> some, another thing to look into. Um, yeah, my colleague, uh, Leonora Neville, has written about how, um, so I think 11th, 12th century, how women in in court or in legal petitions would actually manipulate so the gender norms in order to gain an advantage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I, you know, I think it was a case like this. Oh, yes, I know I signed that contract, but I'm just a weak woman. I just, I'm a woman. I don't understand what was being asked of me. You know, can you annul or whatever? <laughs> And it was like totally cynical because this woman we know like is running these businesses on this, not, not a naive person at all. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, okay. So let's come back to the, um, the domestic situation that women sometimes faced. So how did the asymmetrical dynamics of marriage affect their economic prospects? So one of the interesting things about, women, particularly in the later Roman Empire, is that um, even though this is, you know, a highly patriarchal society, and this ideal construction of women is that they're being sequestered away in the house, and they're just dealing with all of these domestic matters, and they're taking care of kids and all these things, um, they actually have protections for their own economic well-being. So they're able to keep their own inheritances, um, and their dowries are supposed to be returned to them in the event of divorce or, or spousal death. Um, and while legally these, you know, properties or their their assets uh, had to be managed by either a male relative or some other male legal representative, um, there are indications that in in reality social practice wasn't really quite so strict, and that um, like Leonora Neville, 
uh, was talking about women kind of manipulating the the legal processes. Um, they were also able to kind of manipulate the business world um, in to suit their own interests. So as I mentioned before, there's you know numerous examples in the papyri of women entering into contracts, selling property, renting property, lending money, sometimes with a representative, but very often without. This idea that uh, they they needed a, a legal male representative is something that we see in legislation. Um, but the reality seems to be that actually they had a lot more autonomy. Um, but of course, the, you know, this isn't a fail-safe system. Like I said, there's still women who are experiencing extreme poverty when, you know, their husbands leave them or mm. a relative steals their assets. Um, you know, a lot of times if they remarry, uh, there's examples in the papyri of kids from a first marriage getting into legal disputes with their mothers over property and things like that. Um, so it's another one of those things where it's, uh, complicated by the fact that the the sources, the different types of sources are telling us different things. Um, but it it does seem that they have a level of economic independence that maybe, you know, in the past they hadn't been given full credit for. Yeah. And I think that some of Justinian's laws actually increased that. Mm -hmm. uh, he, yeah, especially when it came to inheritance, he he increased the, um, he, he required that daughters receive a portion of the inheritance, not necessarily an equal one, um, and increased their rights in terms of inheritance and dowries and so forth. Um, and I, for a long time, I hadn't realized, you know, how important that actually was and, and, and the fact that it did um, have an impact um, on their um, experiences for a very long time. Um, I ha I've even found a court case from the 11th century again, where a judge strikes down this um, official's will. Actually, so this is a guy from Georgia, from the Caucasus, and he was an imperial official. He'd you know emigrated, taken up office, and for one reason or another, his inheritance had come into legal question, whatever. And he and, and they went before the court, and the judge actually forced him to amend the will so that it. Uh, in, uh, so that his daughters would receive part of the inheritance was not the custom in Georgia. Um, and oh, also, also, oh yes. And this is, this is great too. Jewish women made use of those clauses to go to the Roman courts and not, you know, their own you know, religious leaders at rabbinical courts and secured inheritance rights in the Roman empire that they didn't have outside of it. And we have writings of rabbis who are very, very embarrassed that, you know, they couldn't do anything about this. And, you know, and that their women are like out of control. And anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, that's, that's great. I mean, and even the fact that you have women who are clearly understanding what their rights are in all yes. of these different aspects. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole system of knowledge sharing that's going on um, as well. And you know, alongside women in their inheritance, you know, showing that they're starting to exert more control over who they marry. You know, it's supposed to be mm. up to their fathers, but we have all these examples where actually it seems the father is kind of deferring to what the daughter wants. Um, so the, you know, marriages aren't strictly these business transactions either. So um, right. yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, the papyri sometimes let us see, you know, to glimpse through the the social norms that literary texts construct um, in, in such an important way. Um, I, I think some of our generalizations might turn out to just not be very sound at all. I mean, just like you have found with the textile production, like there's no reason to think that women weren't involved in, you know, commercial textile production. The, the, no source even says that. It's just kind of like a gender imposition that, you know, like kind of what we think makes sense, you know, but what's that based on, right? Um, so there's an important question of a factor to add in here, and that is the question of slavery, uh, because this does actually directly impact textile manufacturing. Um, and I think, oh boy, if I think if you ask the average economic historian, so who did most of the large scale industrial textile production, they'd probably say slaves in workshops, you know, owned by someone, right? Um, so how was slave labor gendered? 
and 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 classified and have have we overestimated the degree to which this uh, sector of the market relied on slave labor or how do you engage with that problem i think there are certain settings where there was certainly a large amount of slave labor um so large private estates um we know that they are producing a lot of textiles and we also know that there's probably a large amount of slave labor working for them but a lot of textile production is also taking place in these smaller family-run workshops and there the picture is less clear um we know that there are weavers who are being hired a lot of times, particularly if they're women, they've been interpreted as slaves, but there's really no nothing to indicate that they are. Um, so slave women in particular, they because they're property, they're not held to the same moral code as free women. So, uh, you know, they're in theory allowed into the market. Uh, they're allowed in public. Um, and so a lot of times when women have been seen in the textile industry in the past they've been interpreted as slaves mm. right. again like i said there, there's actually no reason to think that though mm. um we do know that slave labor is being used in for example the imperial textile factories um Particularly, we see them as settings for penal conscripts who are kind of converted into slaves. The terminology here is also really difficult because sometimes slave does not actually mean slave or it doesn't mean slave in perpetuity. It's like you know, a temporary slave. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of and for the imperial textile factories in particular, we see a lot of gender rhetoric about working in them, particularly this idea that um, it's really shameful because textile work is supposed to be women's work. So, but this is all coming from the literary sources. Um, Sabius, um, Sosman, uh, Lactantius, these sources are all talking about how Christians who are being persecuted are sent to the imperial textile factories and they're forced to be perform women's work. So, weaving uh and this is really shameful and it's below their their station but of course we know that's that's not actually how textile work is being viewed in the time because then we have examples of men who are master weavers um they're at the they're heads of guilds they are you know forming a lot of business relationships and things like that so uh, there's this conflict in in how textile work is being conveyed. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with this idea of status and that this idea that textile work is, you know, somehow um, emasculating mm -hmm. men who are being forced to work in the textile factories uh, is reflective of, of the status that's being um, imposed on them. Yeah. The, this is how, no, exactly how the status hierarchies and gender norms kind of intersect to make it very, very hard for us to see what's actually going on inside these workshops. Uh, but you mentioned guilds. Can you tell us a little bit more about guilds? Because this is another area that's so obscure to me. Like I, I can barely picture a Roman, a, a guild in the Roman Empire. What does it look like? So I, I think the first thing to say is the Roman guild is is not actually probably what we think of as a guild, which is um, as a, a strictly kind of occupational group that's meant to be enforcing standards on products and, um, you know, price fixing or things like that. The guilds in the Roman period seem to serve kind of multiple functions. So one of them is social. The other is occupational. Um, and we have kind of three primary sources of knowledge about the guilds, but none of them give us much information. Mm. So there's more we don't know than there's been what we do know. Um, but the first uh, source for information about guilds is the late antique legal codes um, compiled under emperors Theodosius and Justinian. Um, they both include entire sections on different types of urban guilds. 
Um, the second is we have documents in the Egyptian papyri, and these tend to consist of membership lists, charters, and um, contracts talking about various obligations, um, tax obligations, and things like that. And finally, there's also references to guilds in inscriptions kind of found throughout the empire. But even with all of that information, we have very little information about the internal workings of them. Um, as I said, they kind of serve a social function and an occupational function. So guild members would worship together, celebrate festivals together, as with the uh, the example from Selos, uh, the, the festival mm. of Agathe. Um, and they, they contribute money to other members. So if someone's fallen on hard times or they need money for something like a funeral, you can join guilds that were kind of almost like funeral clubs. So that when you died, there was ensured that um, you know you would have the proper the proper burial. Um, but there, at the same time, the occupational guilds are also responsible for things like um, collective tax obligations. Now, how these different functions relate to each other is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but one of the things that gets talked about. Uh, in relation to guilds the most is this idea that the state exerted a lot of control over them. And this comes in the, uh, from the legal codes. We do see that particularly um, guilds that are related to functions of the state um, have a lot of restrictions imposed on them. So for example, membership is hereditary for some of them. Um, and in the past, this has been interpreted as an indication that maybe the state was exerting a lot of control over all guilds. But actually, I, I think when you start looking at um, what exactly the documents are saying and which guilds in particular are being kind of singled out, it becomes much more clear that the state is actually showing special concern for the activities of workers in state factories and food supply in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so where you have private guilds, they're, they're given much more free reign to govern themselves. So for just as an example, a lot of the codes about um, guild restrictions applied to textile workers are specifically addressed to textile workers in the state factories. And the way this is filtered into kind of the narrative narrative of the textile industry is that the state was exerting control over all textile guilds. And then when you start looking at the way the guild documents in Egypt are talking about membership and their obligations, uh, it, it becomes really clear that they're actually highly autonomous. And if the state is exerting any kind of control over them, it is not reflected anywhere. So I think this is one of those places where actually we're seeing that there's different types of guilds within within the Roman Empire. And there's um, a conception or a perception that guilds that are propping up the functions of the state are being treated very differently to those that are more commercial in nature. Yeah, the especially the guilds that supplied grain to Constantinople from Egypt, the ship owners or captains or whatever, this was highly regulated. Um, and the, I've looked into guilds only from the aspect of the collective insurance, which is kind of weird to think about. But sometimes there seems to be an edict that enforces... Um, responsibilities for collective insurance on the on on the guild for each of its members in other words uh, if there's a cost like a, a ship sinks which happens you know a lot in in that particular um uh, activity then the whole guild will sort of absorb the cost right and this was imposed by constantinople on this entire sector and you for me the so the question I wrestle with is like, is this something that the state is imposing on the guild like to serve its interests rather than theirs? Or is it a situation where it actually is in the interest of the guild, but they can't get they can't enforce it on the membership unless the state does it right? Because, of course, they all want to be insured, I imagine. But individually, they don't want to bear the cost. Right. Like so you have this kind of free rider problem or, you know, and anyway, and it's the same. So there's an inscription from Sardis. I think this is fifth century. 
And this is a guild of builders and carpenters or something like this. And it's this inscription, which is an edict where, again, like the local, I don't know, it's a prefect or some local official is imposing collective responsibility on the guild that if one of their members can't deliver the goods, that the rest of them have to make it up somehow in the time frame and something like that. And I, I, I still, I'm not sure how to interpret all these, but they're, they're pretty fascinating. Um, there's, there's similar obligations for textile workers as well, because they have to pay a certain amount of tax in kind, and that's a collective obligation. Um, so sometimes in the documents, you'll see, you know, if there's a dispute that comes up uh, and someone's trying to shirk their responsibility in this collective obligation, um, you know, then the guild steps in to appeal to, you know, local officials or whomever to, to, Usually it's if someone's trying to to leave, trying to escape their guild um, or not escape even, but just to uh, to leave the, a certain location and go elsewhere. Have you found evidence for women in the guilds? So not in the textile guild, but as I said, uh, I mentioned earlier, there's an example from the builders guild where there's there's women members listed. The exception is widows. So widows of master weavers, because it's master weavers who are the ones who are mm. who are um, members of the guilds. Widows are allowed to maintain their deceased mm. husband's membership. Hmm. Um, and I think the implication is, is probably that you have women performing guild functions, but within the family unit. Um, the other place you can see women is they can be patrons of a guild. Right. Um, so, yeah, so it's unusual, although not unheard of, to, to find women being listed as guild members, but it's usually within a, a familial context. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the lists, for example, of the guild membership list men, but in practice, it's implied that their entire families are part of the activities. Um, and it's just you don't list the women. Yeah. And you see in the in the membership list, you know, their extended families, brothers, cousins, uncles, um, you know, these are people who have kinship ties to each other. So it, there is the implication that guilds are very much associated with family as well. Right. So we're almost out of time, but I wanted to give you a chance to maybe tell us a little bit about where you're taking the future directions of your work on labor. Um, you, you told me you were working a little bit on the um, imperial workshop. So tell us a little bit about that. And, you know, we could defer that for a later episode, uh, you know, once all that's done. Yeah. So I've been looking at um, this idea of forced labor in the imperial textile factories. The reason I started looking at this is as so many things with labor, we don't actually know how these functioned or who worked in them, but they were highly consequential to the internal workings of the empire. They start out in the fourth century supplying clothing to the army um, because the, the state's no longer collecting enough um, from taxes and kind from, mm -hmm. from various textile producers. And it's, seems that a very large proportion of that workforce is some type of forced labor, whether they're slaves or they're convicts or, um, you know, somehow, you know, otherwise kind of indentured in, into these, uh, these workshops. Now, the workshops, even after the sixth century, they kind of stopped providing for the army. Um, provision for the army changes completely in that time period. But we still get reference to the imperial textile workshops, and they're now supplying the emperor almost exclusively. And they are producing these really economically and culturally significant silk textiles that um, you know we have so many surviving examples of. But again, we have such little information about the actual labor in the workshops. It's assumed that because these textiles are so intricate um, that we're talking about professional, professionalized weavers. Um, but then every time we do get a kind of a little glimpse into the inner workings, 
it, it seems that they're forced laborers again. Yeah. So I, I became interested in kind of how this, how this whole thing is working and how are we conceptualizing labor of these really significant materials? Um, yeah, in so modern, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been looking at. Yeah. In, in modern States, often working for the state is a, it's a cushy job. It's got perks, you know, good benefits, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, reading the sort of advanced materials that you sent me about the Imperial workshops in this period, I was like, mm, maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they were particularly nice places to be in. Um, and as kind of a, a an analogous example, there's um, a letter from, this isn't related to the Byzantine Empire, but he's, um, I think it's from the 10th century, a uh, weaver from Cairo who has been basically conscripted into the Imperial Taraz uh, factory in Damascus. And he's trying to petition the caliph to let him go because he really does not want to be there anymore. Um, so just this I idea that forced labor in the, of these, you know, significant uh, textiles is maybe not something that's particular to the Byzantines and is something that we find throughout the Mediterranean. Um, it's, it's really interesting, but I, I just feel so bad for that weaver. <laughs> yeah, or like modern sweatshops. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't need to look far for for that. Uh, while you were speaking, I just remembered another. So these are, I think, uh, women owning a business. So these are two women who are mentioned in Procopius uh, in Italy, and they owned a, an inn, and they ran the inn. Um, the only reason he mentions this, however, is because it was during a famine, and these two women would kill and eat their guests. <laughs> Now, and and that's why it's mentioned. And again, it illustrates how, you know, these, the more literary sources will mention only like really weird cases, but mm -hmm. in the, in the gaps between the weirdness, you see a little glimpse of, yeah, no, it's not a problem for him that there are these two women running an inn. The problem is that they were eating their guests. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That the weird thing is not that they're women. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, Anna, it's been a pleasure. And thank you also for your work. Uh, I learned a lot from what you sent me and, and I look forward uh, to more to come. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Take care.